of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We hear a familiar parable today about the sowing of the seed. I've gone through before what these various types of ground mean. But really, the most important part of the parable is the seed that fell on good ground. Because all the other seed didn't bear fruit. And all the other seed went to hell. So we must bear good fruit. And how are we to do that? So it's fine to say we should be good ground. That's true. But that doesn't help us a lot. We need to learn how to be good ground. And the scripture tells us today, both in the gospel today, the second gospel, and also the, the epistle, tells us how to be good ground. Now the thing that really hits me in this parable are, are two things. One is before the Lord explains what the parable means to his disciples who didn't understand it. He said, he who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And the way I hear that is that I need to learn how to hear. How do we learn to hear? How do we develop ears to hear? Because if you don't have ears to hear, you don't hear anything. Or that is, you hear things, but you don't understand them. Most people hear things and don't understand them. We should not be like most people. We must be among the elect, the people of God, who hear things in a way that we understand them. This is very, very important. So how do we develop ears to hear? That would be the same as saying, how do we develop good ground? Any of you that have done gardening or farming know that ground doesn't in and of itself produce well. You must do things to the ground for it to produce well. You must plow it. You must get rid of weeds. You must amend it. You must take care of it during the growing season or else it will just produce thorns or it won't even germinate the seed. In Texas, of course, if the ground is not taken care of, it just, there are just huge cracks in it in July when the, when the rains come because it's so dry and it just cracks the ground and the ground is not even good for growing anything whatsoever. So to have good ground takes effort. To have ears to hear takes effort. So we should not assume that we have ears to hear or that we have good ground. We should be working towards this aim. And the rest of the parable, that is the explanation especially, and parts of the Gospels, the other Gospel and the Epistles, explain to us how we can have this good ground. That's the critical thing. This is basically, like I told you before, I tell the same sermon every single time. It's all about living in the heart. If you don't live in the heart, then you have no chance. I'll tell you a story. Well, first I'll tell you the second thing that hits me from this parable. So, the Lord says when he's explaining it to the disciples, they on the good ground are they that in an honest and good heart, having heard the word of God, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. What's important there is if we have an honest and good heart. Without an honest and good heart, you have no chance whatsoever for salvation. Now you can say, well, I'm not a good person. How can I be saved if I'm not a good person? You must develop within yourself, and only a very few people in the world are not capable of doing this. There are people that don't do it. There are people that live in such a pathological way that they'll, they'll, never, they'll never find God. And I'm not just talking about people who are psychopaths or sociopaths. I'm talking about average people who just live without any thought for their heart. Their, their heart's not good and honest then. Because the only way to have a good heart is to live within the heart. And God is within the heart. And God helps the heart to be good. So how do we develop this good heart? This good, honest heart? I've told you thousand times before, I'll tell you a thousand more times, probably 10,000. If you can't be good, at least be kind. That's where it begins. It begins by living as best you can according to the love of God, which means to love others, which means to love your enemy, which means to not gossip about your enemy, which means to not be angry at someone or jealous at someone, which means to pray for them, which means to do your prostrations for them, 
giving your blood to God for people that you care about and perhaps also the people that you don't care about but you should care about. This is how we start to develop that good ground, that good heart. I'll tell you a story. Marina and I were talking about it when we were on South Padre or North Padre Island, South Texas. And we remembered that it was a time when Daniel had a little fender bender accident, not a big deal, backed out a little bit, not taking, taking care to see that there was a car coming. He was a brand new driver. And a car hit him, and it was his fault because he backed into their path, right, in the parking lot. And the man was very magnanimous, and he said, oh, I have a teenage son also. You don't want this to go on your insurance. This is just a small matter. Let's just settle this privately, and then you won't have it go on your insurance. And we believed him. So he took $1,500 from us. And later on, we found out just by accident somehow that he had filed with our insurance. So he had taken the money and filed for the insurance. He had stolen $1,500. And so he did it. It's not a, didn't really hurt us too much or anything, but it hurt his soul. Because if you have that kind of soul and don't repent from it, you have no chance, no chance of salvation. None. Now perhaps he repented. I hope he did. Probably it would be a good idea to write down in my diptychs the man who stole $1,500 and do a prostration for him. Seriously, I'm not kidding at all. Because God wants him to be saved as much as, as us. But what he did was, was really egregious because it was so simple. It was, it was an opportunity, and there's a French proverb, I'm told, what it, all it takes to make a thief is an opportunity. Well, that's a very cynical idea. That's not true. A Christian is not a thief. An honest and good heart is not a thief. But this man was a thief. Probably didn't steal in general, but this was an opportunity, and he took advantage of it. And if, a, if you have these kinds of conveniences that come up to you, and you're dishonest in small ways, and you're just thinking of yourself in other ways, how could you be saved if you do this? I mean, we're supposed to pray without ceasing. We're supposed to pray with hundreds of prostrations a night. How many of us do that? Huh? St. Pius just did 5,000 a night when he had stomach cancer. And he prayed with, with his heart. Well, none of us really pray that well with our hearts. Not very often, do we? If we can't do that, then what are we going to offer to God? You've got to offer him something. This is what we offer to him, an honest and good heart. Kindness to others, awareness of our own faults, awareness of our own lethargy and, our, and our all, all of our problems, humility about ourselves, love for our fellow man, being magnanimous to our fellow man, and saying, well, oh, the reason why he's doing that is he's being tempted. I will pray for him. Not the reason he's doing that is because he's a total jerk. He's always been a jerk. Not like that but to make excuses for people, but not excuses for ourselves. That's an honest and good heart. And if you practice that kind of way of living, then your heart is open. And guess what happens when the heart is open? God comes into the heart. And he takes his residence, his abode in your heart. All of him, in your little tiny heart, which actually evidently must be very big, huh? Or as I've told you before, it's a deep heart. As the psalmist says, this is how God comes in the heart. Now, he doesn't come in the heart by us first doing lots of prostrations, lots of the Jesus prayer, and going to vigils and all these things. That's not what begins it. What begins it is that we want to be good, and that we try to be good, even in the trivial ways in which we, are, we can encounter life where we're kind to others when they're not kind to us, where we don't press our own agenda when someone's pressing theirs, where when somebody gets credit in the office for something we did, we don't protest it, we just let it go. When we have an accident that's not our fault, we don't say, hmm, this is an opportunity for me to make 1,500 bucks. This is how you have an honest and good heart. And then God does the supernatural. That's just mundane, just to not steal from people. You don't get a whole lot of credit for that, okay? I mean, even people who are not believers don't steal from each other. That's not too impressive. 
or don't slander each other and such. But if you do those things, the mundane things, with God helping you, of course, then God fills your heart. And then you start to have ears to really hear, to really hear what's going on in the world, to really see the reality of everything. And the, the, the curtain will lift and you will see what's true, not only about yourself, but about the world. We see an example. I'll just make one pandemic reference today. So, you know, it's, it's something that keeps going. It's not going to stop. It's not going to stop. The, the repercussions of it are not going to stop. People losing their faith because of it are not going to, it's not going to stop. So it's important to see this. So now that I tell you, I apologize for why I would make a reference. I don't remember the reference I was going to make. How about that? I should have been more forceful and just gone ahead and said it. So sometimes that happens, you know. I'm not speaking with notes, just a couple squiggles on a piece of paper. But the reason people are losing their faith, maybe this is what I was about to say, is because they're, they're choked. They're choked, as the, as the gospel tells us, choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and, or they're on the rocky ground, which has very little depth. And the reason, fundamentally, for all of that is because they're not living in their heart. So that's the key. Live in your heart. And if you want to say, how do you do that? I could tell you, I don't know. I just know how to start doing it. Okay? I can't explain it to you. There's nobody that can explain it to you. St. John Chrysostom couldn't explain it to you. Our Lord Jesus Christ wouldn't explain it to you with words. He would explain it to you with actions. And with His grace, and the grace, of course, of the Holy Trinity, coming within our heart. That's how we learn to live in the heart. But you have to struggle to do this. So let's just start doing the easy stuff. If you can't be considerate to other people, guess what? You've got pretty much no chance to be saved. Now, okay, if you're, if you're irritable, if you're irascible, and sometimes you, you do things that you know you shouldn't do, well, learn to apologize, okay? Some of us are blessed with, I'm not speaking to myself here, blessed with a spirit that, you know, it's pretty... It doesn't really get irritated about things. God bless you if you're like that. But if you're not like that, then you have to learn to apologize. See? And if you don't apologize for your irascibility, then you pretty much don't have a whole lot of chance. Because how can you hear God if you've got all this anger and all this noise and everything in your heart? You can't. We're responsible for trying to clear out some of that. Now, perhaps, really, if you, do, if you were mathematical about it, we clear out one one thousandth of that noise and God takes the rest but he wants to see that you do that little part we have a lot of children here what happens when, the, when our child doesn't want to pick up right what do we do they got this chain set and there's everything everywhere and they don't want to pick anything up so we say let's get started working right so we pick up 15 things and they pick up one and then we pick up another seven things and they pick up two and eventually we picked up 90% of it, and they have accomplished that they have obeyed us, right? Doesn't that happen all the time? I think it happens all the time. It happens in my house, that's for sure, right? Then you sing that song, clean up, clean up. Oh, I get tired of that song. Owen loves that song. You know, I'd rather just clean up in silence. So, we must struggle to have a good heart and then God will fill it with himself. So let's here see some other things that are from the Gospels and from the epistles that relate to this. So, he said that we bring forth the fruit with patience. Patience. How do you get patience? There's only one way to get patience. There's only one way. To have stuff that makes you impatient. That's it. It's the only way. So you have to learn to deal with things that make you impatient, with grace. And there's, in the, less, in the next gospel, the one for St. Luke, at the end of the gospel, the, or end of the selection, the Lord says, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. There's how to have an honest and good heart, to be like a babe. 
to be like a babe regarding evil. Are the little babies evil? No. No, exactly. They're not evil at all, are they? They get a little older, and then they learn to take on our, the, you know, our example, unfortunately. And they learn to be, you know, all the things that we do. But little babies are not evil. They don't think about evil. They're not jealous. They're not angry. They're not irritable. They cry because they're wet or because they're lonely or because they're scared or because they're hungry or tired. Other than that, right? This is how we should be. We should be babes regarding evil. Now, we should be wise regarding virtue and regarding knowledge. We shouldn't be like babes in that way. But we should be babes regarding evil. We should learn to not care about the things that happen to us and have a response for them. To be babes regarding evil. Now, perhaps you would say, oh, great, Father Seraphim, you tell me to live in the heart and to be a babe regarding evil. I have no idea how to do either one of those things. I don't either. But I do know that as we do them, we learn to do them. Now, maybe that sounds like circular reasoning to you, and you'd get an F if you wrote that on a paper in seventh grade, but it's true. This is the way it happens. You learn to live in the heart by starting to live in the heart. You learn by be, to be a babe regarding evil by learning to be a babe regarding evil, by just doing it. God will help you. You know that there are things in your heart that are not right. You know there are reactions you have to people that are just not right. You got to cut it off you know, with that stuff. Knock it off with that stuff. That's how you start to learn to live in the heart. Your heart tells you. You hear something about somebody, and your heart feels dark. Why is it dark? Oh, it's dark because I always thought that person was a braggart. Or that person, you know, stole my boyfriend or girlfriend from me when I was in high school. Or that person always speaks evil of me. Your heart tells you. The darkness in your heart, that kind of twisting in your heart, it tells you. You start to learn to do that. Everybody can learn to do that. Really. It's really possible. Everyone can learn to do this. You start to listen to what your inner motivations are, and then God will show you. It's like, that motivation's a bad one right there. Don't do it. And to the best of your ability, you, st you stop doing it. And there are two other things to mention a little bit quickly from the epistles that are telling us how to become this good ground and how to have ears to hear. And for that matter, eyes to see. So St. Paul says he would not glory except in his infirmities. You ever thought of doing that? Glorying in your infirmities? Now that doesn't mean bragging on your infirmities. That just means flat out saying, I am what I am. I am a sinner. I'm not very good at prayer. I'm inattentive. I'm lazy sometimes. I have these bad habits. And to say, to God, I'm not angry at you because of this and that. I'm not angry because I don't have a good job or because of this or because of that. You glory in your infirmities. You just say, I am what I am. That's really what it means. Obviously, we don't want to brag about our infirmities. you know. So I can say, I'm more sinful for, than you. That's a way of being more proud than you. you know. And if we do that, and if we're just aware of our infirmities and begging God to help us, and the prayers certainly help us, because they're full of this stuff, then we will, our heart opens to God. And that's the whole point. All, all you're responsible for doing is opening a crack in your heart. Because God will come through the crack. Light can go through any crack. And then the crack widens, and eventually the heart is wide open for Christ. And another thing is this. At the end of the uh, selection, of St. Paul's epistle to the sec uh, second epistle to Corinthians. He says, My grace is sufficient for thee, and my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly will I therefore glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest on me. Your God's grace is sufficient. Do you really believe that? Come on, let's be honest. There are times when we kind of don't believe that, do we? That's despondency. That's the sin of despondency. And, or, or a form of it. There are other forms of the sin of despondency. Well, we just don't really believe we can get over the hump. 
you don't believe you can get over the hump, then you don't believe God. You don't believe his grace is sufficient. He made you somehow inadequately. You're not tall enough, smart enough. You're everything you need to be to be saved. God made you perfectly. So your grace, his grace is sufficient for you to be saved. Absolutely. And we have to believe in this. But we also have to know that this, our strength is perfected in our weakness. The world thinks that's very bizarre. I mean, there's not a Hollywood movie where that happens. Because that's a strange idea. But strength is perfected in weakness. And then we have a good heart. And the last thing is, I used to have a journal called Redeeming the Time. I love that phrase. It appears several times in, in the scriptures. We have to redeem the time. Everything is precious. Everything's important. There's nothing that doesn't matter. Everything matters. Because you're in the midst of that moment, and you're a Christian in that moment. Either you're going to act like a Christian here or you're not. It doesn't matter if you're taking out the garbage, or if you're talking to somebody, or if you're going to work, or if you're seeing a sunset on the beach, which I did yesterday. And every day of the past week, prayed on the beach and saw the sunrise. It doesn't matter what moment you're in, whether it's a really wonderful moment or somewhat mundane. Every moment matters. Everything matters to redeem the time. And if we have that attitude, then we'll indeed have ears to hear. We'll start to understand stuff. And the next time I preach about this, which will be next week, of course, then you'll say, I think I know a little bit about living in the heart. I think I know a little bit. I know a little bit about being more like a babe regarding evil. I kind of get it a little bit. And then you'll get a little bit more, and then eventually... The heart's wide open, and God is in the heart. That's how it happens. It's really a beautiful process, but it does take labor. It does take work. So you supply the labor. God supplies the ability. It's a wonderful combination. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful teamwork. So God bless you and help you in all things. Amen.